Joining us now is Jeff Clavier, a venture capitalist and founder of Soft Tech VC, a firm that counts Groupon among its many investments. Jeff, welcome back to Bloomberg West. Always great to Thank have you so here. Much. Great to so, be back. As an investor, I mean, what's your reaction to this? You know, Groupon has been taken like a pinata, been beaten like a pinata over the past few weeks, few months, and they were not able to respond because of the credit period issues. I think that, and I don't know anything per se because I'm a small investor, so I'm not briefed by the company, but if they were to step back and try and solidify some of the metrics that the Curry just shared, and by the way, yes, it's more expensive to acquire customers when there's a lot of, of competition, but the question is, what's the LTV? What is the long-term value of those customers? And I think that on a cohort basis, they look good on that. So if they were to step back and try and, and solidify the metrics and show that they have a really great business where they scale the revenues and they can actually sustain the margins because the marketing dollars are going down, as this, uh, that they're spending, could actually just improve the outlook and get people less nervous about their business. They have to do something about all those rumors. It's hurting, I think, the customer acquisition and the ability to hire. And so those are two issues that are critical to them. So do you think this has to do with issues other than market volatility, potentially the SEC looking at that leaked memo from Andrew Mason, analysts, like you said, pummeling Groupon about its business model? I don't know for a fact what has sort of uh, led them to delay this roadshow, but as as a, as an insider, as a, as an investor, I would say that getting this thing postponed by a couple of quarters, you know, to just solidify the outlook of the business, that is interesting. It's one of the fastest growing companies out there. Wouldn't be a bad thing. As an insider, looking from the outside and seeing these kind of PR missteps, if you will, has that been at all disappointing or frustrating for you? It's a young company. It's been like, uh, I'm going to be sort of nice to them for one second. It's a young company. They've, they've grown fantastically well. They are pioneering in a new business that is even scaring, you know, the biggest companies like, you know, Google or Facebook. And so, yes, there are missteps and yes, there are issues in China. And yes, there's like this thing where the insiders, not us, but the earlier investors, taking $800 million off the table feels weird but at the same time $900 million dollars they've taken off million. the table Extra that's a lot you know uh, so 900 million dollars taken off the table which is so uncommon and I would say that if they had taken maybe you know 200 or 150 and left the rest of that cash in the company people would feel much different about this notion that hey those guys actually made their money and now we're just left with what might not be such a, a great business so my, my outlook on the company is still sort of positive. I, th I think they have short-term issues to deal with. This postponing thing might just be an opportunity for them to do so. Zynga has also filed for an IPO. We really haven't heard a peep from them. It is also uncommon uh, to see a, a, a CEO of a company that's about to go public release a, a huge memo to its employees that has additional financial information that's not in the S-1 filing. It's uncommon for uh, PR reps to call journalists and ba basically, you know, in some ways threaten them about their coverage. Yeah, it's, it's very uncommon. As I said, they've had a couple of missteps in terms of execution and Young company, young CEO, you know, we'll see how that pans out um, at the end of the day. Canceling the IPO, is that something they should consider at this point? I don't know whether postponing for some time or canceling is sort of, I don't know when is the, the time that you can actually go back and talk to the public and dismiss a lot of those rumors and, and innuendos around, around Groupon that would allow them to sort of set the record straight. As an investor, what would you advise them to do? What would you like to see them do? Continue building the business, focus on that, and then maybe wait for uh, better circumstances to go public. If Groupon does end up raising a ton of money in its IPO, is that going to kind of vindicate it to a certain extent, or will there still be questions, fundamental questions about Groupon's business model? From that standpoint, they can, you know, communicate every quarter about the business. They can actually sort of fight, you know, in a sense, all those sort of rumors that have been, you know, around for a while now. And I do think that they can point to the execution as a proof of sustainability of the business. And uh, last night I tweeted about um, an article that Henry Blodgett actually wrote, which was sort of, I think, a, a fair statement around the, the, the group on opportunity, which is they can actually make money. It's going to be hard. It's going to take time. But hey, they're building a brand new business from, from, from the ground up. Okay, but is it worth $25 billion? 
the market will be will basically sort of figure that out, right? We'll know when the, uh, the the large institutionals have the opportunity to buy their block, where they actually want to buy it. Should Groupon have accepted the six billion dollar offer from Google? You know, I wish I had said yes to to Reid Hoffman uh, in two thousand four about his um, his uh, Series A, and I said no, and I can't go back. So I think I don't think so. I think Groupon has an opportunity. We'll know. So six months from now, a year from now, what do you think Groupon is going to look like? I think it's going to be it's going to be one or two large competitors in that market. Groupon and Living Social seem to be sort of the best placed. Uh, there will be a lot of, of churn amongst the uh, early competitors that won't be able to scale. Um, I'm not sure whether you know cash will stop pouring in the space because today, if you have a daily deal site, you can still be funded, which to me is sort of a bit um, a bit crazy. Um, the fact that Facebook sort of stepped back, the fact that Yelp stepped back, just shows that it's hard. Even for people like Facebook who have 750 or 800 million you know, users, it's actually hard to get that business going. So I think that that is a defensible position from Groupon's standpoint. Welcome back to Bloomberg West. I'm Emily Chang. Just a few hours ago, TechCrunch's founding editor, Michael Arrington, voiced his frustrations on the blog and announced the two options that have been proposed to AOL. Arrington wrote, reaffirmation of the editorial independence promised at the time of acquisition. That means autonomy from Huffington Post, unfettered editorial independence, and a blanket right to editorial self-determination. To put it simply, TechCrunch would stay with AOL, but would be independent of the Huffington Post, or sell TechCrunch back to the original shareholders. We're back with Jeff Clavier, venture capitalist and founder of SoftTech VC, and Michael Arrington is one of your limited partners yes. in SoftTech VC. Strong words there from him saying, basically, uh, give us independence from the Huffington Post or sell us back to shareholders. How do you weigh in on this whole crunch fund debate? So, um, so Michael is uh, one of my limited partners and he's been a longtime friend. Um, so I haven't talked to him since the whole thing started unraveling. Um, I was aware of the crunch fund. This is something that uh, you mentioned to me as uh, a few weeks ago. And I don't think that all the details had been worked out as to how the, the potential issue of you know, tech crunch on one side, crunch crunch on the other would actually work. But at the end, it felt that Michael was essentially taking the next step in his career, becoming a VC and investing in the startups that he actually you know, loves to hang out with and, and support. So looking at tech crunch and the whole sort of quagmire, there's really sort of three things. One is Michael's role, there is the um, editorial independence and where crunch fund is sourcing, sourcing the deal flow. Editorial independence is something which is very key and, and clear to the staff that they need to retain. And it's always been one of the key objectives of Michael before negotiating the deal with AOL. So it's just reminding them that this is what they signed up for originally. And whether Michael is here or not doesn't change anything. And as there, you know, there was a couple of posts from Paul Carr and, and MJ Siegler around the way TechCrunch works, which is sort of pretty unusual from the standpoint of traditional media. There's no real editorial sort of review. And so Michael being here or not doesn't really change much from the standpoint of, of that process. And so the fact that he wants this to be maintained is completely legitimate. How do you think AOL handled all of this? Oh, I'm not sure. So I don't know whether they were ready to announce it and they kind of announced it and they completely screwed it up or they were scooped, they rushed out the gate trying to sort of figure out things at the last minute, feels like it. I mean, at it? this point, it's unclear whether Michael Arrington still works for TechCrunch or AOL at all. Based on his post, which I read just coming in, it's not clear, right? So his year is there, he's no longer there. I actually don't know what would make sense from his standpoint. Is is running a fund, is one of my peers, right? And therefore, being on the business development side of AOL might make sense or not. The fact that it's clear that he's detached from the editorial side and he doesn't influence or can't influence based on his investments, what happens at TechCrunch, I think, is important from a perspective standpoint. What I can tell you is that we've co-invested a lot together in the past, and he was so hard on the companies, beating them up as soon as they were, were making a misstep, even though he had invested, means that he's not sort of the best friend of the company that he puts money in, I can tell you. That said, let's take a step back here. What does coverage in TechCrunch mean to you as an investor and for your portfolio companies? If you get a profile in TechCrunch, isn't that a huge boon to the companies that you're, you're invested in? Well, so when we 
obviously, as the early stage investors, we're here to help with PR and for us getting coverage across the different, you know, um, sites, whether it's TechCrunch and GigaOM and all things D, or with uh, New York Times and so on and so forth, uh, TV sometimes, as well, uh, is actually course. very important. Of course, Bloomberg is very important, right? So getting TechCrunched is nice, but what it creates is a blip, you know, a boost in, in traffic, and then the whole thing goes, goes down. Because in a lot of cases, some of that sort of traffic that is generated is just not the target of the company. And so, yes, it's nice, but it's not a, a absolute must have that will sort of make the company sort of successful. Are investors worried that if they don't invest in the crunch fund, that they won't get as no. positive coverage on TechCrunch? No. Because that's what some of these reports that we're seeing are indicating. I, I really, I honestly, truthfully don't believe that. And even if Michael wasn't sort of my buddy or wasn't you know my investor, I would say that, I would say that because I've worked with those guys. Uh, you know, whether it's MJ, whether it's Sarah Lacey, whether it's, you know, the, the number of sort of great guys at TechCrunch, and they really don't care about, you know, who has invested in them. What matters is, is this an interesting company? Is there a good story, right? So whether you have to pay up to be covered in TechCrunch is actually pretty insulting, I find. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about Techstars. You've been a Techstar mentor for four years. Yep. We're about to launch a Techstars program awesome. here on Bloomberg Television. Tell me a little bit about uh, the program and, and the role it plays in developing young companies. Yeah, so Techstars is one of the, um, the early sort of incubators, accelerators, whatever you call sort of that category. Uh, y Combinator was the, um, the reference, the oldest one. And uh, my good friend, sort of Brad Feld, one day mentioned to me that uh, he was helping David Cohen to build up Techstars in Boulder, which is sort of an unusual sort of location uh, for us to sort of look into companies because we are really focused on Silicon Valley in New York. But, you know, Brad invited me over and I met all the companies and I sort of uh, gave them my feedback as to what was working, not working, and so on and so forth, and became a de facto mentor of the program. And I really like sort of the focus of, you know, having 10, 11, 12 companies spending three, four months in the bunker literally a bunker, you know, um, in Boulder, where they get all this advice from great mentors, from David Cohen, who's sort of always there, and this, this petri dish where all those founders can really help each other. And that's been, I think, a tremendous experience for all those founders who never regretted having spent time there and never regretted the, uh, you know, five or six percent of equity that it caused them to actually um, uh, go there. So it's one of the great programs. It's now expanded to, uh, to New York, and I'm also an, a mentor of the New York program, actually uh, reviewing all those guys next week uh, before their big day in, uh, in October. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's just a great program, great, great acceleration. What are we going to learn on this show that would surprise us about founding a company or investing in a company? Sorry? What are we going to learn on this new television show, Tech Stars, that would surprise us about what it's like to found a company or, or invest in a company? I think you will see the human side of, of founding a company, how sometimes unsure that journey is, and how important having you know, all those great mentors surrounding the company is to give yourself comfort, but also sometimes just tell you that you're flat wrong and you should be doing something else, because that's our role. We don't, we don't always very nice to those guys. All right. Well, I can't wait to see it. Jeff Clavier of Soft Tech VC, thanks for joining us. Always great to have you here. Thank you so much. On the show. And